Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Skudik Education and Research Center, the campus of the Skudik Institute, partners with Acadia National Park. I've been working on that little introduction there, but to make it as concise as possible. Good job. <laughs> Thank you. Um, today, we're, we're, um, it's a pleasure to have with us um, a local naturalist and a good friend of mine, who I'll introduce in just a second, but I do want to say that this today, now, this event, is the culminating event of a, a first time that we've um, accreted or married the International Migratory Bird Day celebration with um, uh, Junior Ranger Day. So the morning started out from 8 to 10 with a bird walk, which was attended mostly by adults, or all, all adults, and then starting at 10 o'clock, we had um, 17 or 19 learning stations across the campus um, that um, mostly families came to and could take advantage of the, the various um, learning stations, such as um, uh, bird, bird feeding adaptations, you know, using tweezers like, a, like a, a blue heron might do to catch fish or catching uh, plastic flies out of the air. Um, different things like that, uh, as well as uh, we had Ed Hawks, who's a master bird carver here, and he had his wares and was demonstrating how he does wood carving. We had folks talking about owls and dissecting owl pellets, looking through microscopes at different uh, items just to get kids used to the idea that when you look through a microscope, you can really see the details of things, really dig in there deep and not necessarily see these these, the world at large, but you can get inside that world. So it was a, a fascinating morning, um, stifled only a little bit by the weather, which held back the, the throngs that we expected. But nevertheless, it was a success, and I'm so glad that you all came here today. So as I said, our culminating um, program is a um, slide presentation by Zach Cliver on um, seabirds, whales, and marine life of the Scudic Ridges. Zach is one of our Scudic scholars. So in an effort to um, promote the Scudic Institute and its association with Acadia National Park, we have um, 18 or so people who are um, what we call Scudic scholars. The, the Institute provides a, a minimal stipend in exchange for the erudition of these local naturalists, artists, poets, things like that, folks like that who come together and do things. So we've had a couple of really successful workshops held by the scholars, and um, today we're thrilled to have Zach Cliver with us to, to do this particular um, uh, slideshow presentation. Now, Zach and I go back a little bit. I came to um, Maine and Acadia National Park in 1991 um, as a interpretive ranger on the Mount Desert side. And I met Zach through a f another friend, another ranger named Bryant Woods, who unfortunately is the late Bryant Woods. But together, uh, the three of us would, would go around on, on our off days and, and do some birding locally, especially on MDI. And so we, we got to know each other's um, abilities really well. And, it, and obviously in 1991, we were all much younger than we are now. Um, but even then, with Zach, you know, barely out of his teens, um, he was a, an accomplished naturalist. And so we became fast friends and have remained so even though our lives have gone in, in different directions. Um, now that I'm back and now that he's a scholar, we are working on some, some ideas for monitoring the seabirds that, that his company, which he'll describe, um, sees off, offshore when they go out on their tours. And um, in general is helping me sort of with this landscape of scholars and what we can be doing to increase the knowledge of, of the natural history of this area. So without further ado, I would like to introduce my friend, great naturalist, Zach Cliver. Thank you. OK, 
Okay, well, good afternoon, and thank you all very much for being here. How's everyone doing? Good? Great. Okay, well, Seth, thank you very much for uh, bringing me here today and allowing me the opportunity to talk. And uh, I appreciate all the kind things you said. Um, and it's been a pleasure knowing you for this many years, going on, what, 25 years or so. Um, one story I'd like to tell that, w that keeps me a little humble, though, even after nice introductions like um, Seth's, uh, is one from the early 90s when I was working as an observer uh, for the National Marine Fisheries Service. And at that time, um, and still today, there are observers uh, that go out on dredging ships between the Carolinas and Florida. Uh, uh, these ships are dredging the channels out along the coast there at the bigger ports um, to make sure that the ships can get in and out where it's all sandy bottom. And that is also the home during the winter to the North Atlantic right whale. So there's, a lot, there's potential for the right whales to get hit by these ships and they put observers uh, out on the ships to, to spot the right whales uh, to make sure they know where they are uh, so the ships can avoid them. And I did that for many years. I uh, worked um, there during the winter months, uh, stationed on ships, spotting right whales off the ships as they, as they went in and out and dug up the ocean floor. And uh, these ships, I'm not sure if you're familiar with, a, with the dredging ships, they're, they're really pretty impressive. Some of them 400 feet long, and they actually have arms they put in the water, and they suck up sand from down below, and they can, they can take on about 300 dump truck loads of sand into the hull of the ship. Then they take it out, and the ship actually splits apart it's uh, in two halves, and it's hydraulically pushed apart. It breaks in half at sea, and, the, and all the sand is dumped offshore. And so uh, on, after we're done dredging, we were able to go down and, and inspect the, these cages that we had on board to make sure that sea turtles weren't being ca killed in the process of dredging. And there were all sorts of exciting things you'd find in those cages, um, shark's teeth, uh, extinct giant white shark's teeth, megalodon, the great big teeth, um, fossils. And uh, one night I was exploring and I found what I thought was a walrus skull. It was big and, I, and it had t tusks that came down. And, and uh, so I took it up to the bridge and I showed the captain. He said, okay, take it, don't, don't tell anyone. So um, I'm very excited about this. I wrapped it up, I take it back to shore and I went to the director of the project and I said, I gotta show you this walrus skull, this, this fossil rise walrus skull that I found. And uh, so he, he proceeded to open it up and look at it. And he looked at it a little bit and then he turned it upside down. And he was like, Zach, isn't this a goat skull? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, man, yeah that, is, that actually is a goat skull. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so it keeps me humble. Okay, so um, this has been my home, the Friendship Five and Boats Like It for 25 years. Um, there's my station up on the top of the boat and I have the great fortune of being able to take people out every day. I've, I've done somewhere between three and 4,000 whale watching trips now off Mount Desert Island. And uh, this is a picture from Petit Manan Island looking at the boat. Um, and every day we, uh, on our way offshore in the morning, we stop at Petit Manan Island to see the puffins and the seabirds that are there. So we go by Skudik Point and it gives us a great opportunity, myself and all the guides that work for me, to promote what's happening here at Skudik and all the exciting things, the new research, and uh, talk, you know, really encourage people to come over here and, uh, and visit uh, and uh, go online and look at all the exciting programming that's being done. So we're really excited about everything that's happening here and hope to keep working with uh, all of you to, to make it even more successful and, uh, and exciting into the future. So this is Petit Manan Island. For those of you that are not as familiar with this area, it's about seven miles from here. It's up the coast 
and it has the second largest lighthouse on the coast of Maine, and it is part of the Maine Coastal Islands National Wildlife Refuge. It's one of about 50 islands that have been set aside for seabirds and wildlife, and there is a research staff that lives out on the island, and uh, I thought I'd talk about this because it is such an important seabird nesting island, and a lot of the birds that I'll talk about now um, off, that we see offshore, off Scudic Point, and out at the Scudic Ridges, um, come from Petit Manan. They're nesting, they're nesting here on Petit Manan during the, the summer. We actually have the ability when we arrive there to communicate to the staff on the island. We have radios that we use during the trip so we can talk to them when we arrive and uh, passengers on board can ask them questions. And now we have uh, TVs on board so that we can, uh, we have a, a, a uh, video camera on the island and we can, and it immediately picks up the signal from the island. We can see birds on the island, on the boat, on the TV screens. So this is uh, the area I'd like to focus on, and you can see that red star shows Bar Harbor, where, the, where um, is our home, my home base. And then you can see the route that our boat travels in the morning is in red. And then on the afternoon, we just go straight out, and uh, we go past Skudik into Petit Manan Island, and then offshore, and the Skudik Ridges um, there's this really special environment about 12 to 13 miles to the southeast of here. So if you're standing at Skudik Point, if you look straight out, you're, you're looking more toward Mount Desert Rock, right, which is a little, more, a little bit more to the west. But if you, look, if you look off to your left more, you'll be looking in the direction that we go to get to Sk the Skudik Ridges. There's an inner Skudik Ridge and there's an outer Skudik Ridge, and it's a very mountainous um, seafloor. And it, um, we, dis we discovered it, we didn't know that it was great for whales until about the 1991 or 92. Um, up until that point, we always spent our time at Mount Desert Rock. But when we, f we discovered it, I remember the morning that we arrived there and uh, there were lots of whales and there were lots of fishing boats at that time. And at that time, the fishermen, uh, a lot of the boats were gill netting for ground fish and those boats are gone but the whales are still there. And it's, it's become such an important area for us that the, the fishermen have always called this part of the bottom the ballpark, and we've kind of adopted it and renamed it Whale Park. Okay, so this is the area we call Whale Park. Um, I don't know if you can see that, that dark line. It's a little bit hard to see. I'm sorry, I don't have a better map here, but it looks kind of like a hippo. Do you see the one uh, in the very center of the yellow box? There's a, there's a figure there, that's what we, we call, we kind of think of the ballpark as looking like a giant hippo. Now what happens here um, that's so important, especially uh, as we go into summer, is that there's a, it's a great mixing of cold, nutrient-rich water coming down from, from the Arctic through the Labrador Current, right? And that cold water is rich in dissolved nutrients like oxygen and carbon, and the fact that it has, that cold water has the ability to hold lots of, of chemicals, can, can dissolve those chemicals and hold onto it, well, those are great food for plants. And you can see up in the top left corner, there's a slide that shows little plant life in the ocean. Those are phytoplankton, and that is the foundation of the food chain. That's why the ocean water here looks green. Uh, those little plants then in turn become food for the zooplankton, the little animal life, and especially if you look in that far bottom uh, left corner, um, this animal plankton that's a, a, a copepod, a calamus copepod, which are extremely abundant and are really a very important part of the food chain uh, for birds and, and even whales and sharks uh, feed on, on, the, on the plankton. So uh, what happens there at those ridges, the water depth drops from 300 feet to 600 feet all along the coast of Maine, and especially there um, where you have the cold water coming down the coast of Maine, hitting those ridges and welling up. There's tremendous upwelling of cold water, and there's a whole food chain that blooms there, and it, it really begins with these plankton. And so you'll notice as you arrive in that area, the amount of life increases greatly. And 
It also leads to Atlantic herring showing up. This is a very important um, type of fish um, that uh, feed on plankton and they are a critical part of the marine food chain. Um, a lot of whales and fish feed on the, on the herring, so this is very important that we protect the Atlantic herring and maintain their abundance to keep that great diversity of wildlife offshore. Okay, here is the puffin. Okay, well, how many people here have seen puffins? Okay, wow, well, almost everyone, okay. The kids here, not all the kids have seen puffins yet. Okay, well, you have to come whale watching with us this summer. And uh, the Atlantic puffin nests on six islands here off the coast of Maine. And they uh, have the ability to fly far offshore and capture lots of fish. On the inside upper roof of their mouth, they have little serrated um, prongs that are like teeth, and they can actually take with their tongue uh, pr and pry a fish up onto the roof of the mouth, and it sticks there, and then they can swim back down up to maybe 200 feet underwater, capture another fish, and then pry it on the roof. And they've been known to come back with as many as about 60 fish in their mouth. Yes. So they're a bird that fly far offshore, capture lots of fish, and bring them back to their young. They're super fun to see. They nest at Petit Manam, and we see them a lot out off of, uh, not so much close to Scudic Point, but definitely um, out at Scudic Ridges. We see them out there feeding. Um, the, their abundance really goes back to the puffin projects. I'm, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with that, with um, Steve Kress, who's up in the top right corner. And here's a bunch of puffins on top of a blind. And uh, the National Audubon Society started this project over 35 years ago, reintroducing puffins back to the coast of Maine. Uh, Steve Kress got permission from the Canadian government to fly up to Newfoundland in the spring where there's lots of baby puffins and collect hundreds of them, fly them back to Eastern Egg Rock here, just south of where we are, and they made nests that go back in the ground, about uh, five feet to 10 feet in the ground, and they put a baby puffin chick in each nest. And then five times a day, they would drop little fish at the mouth of the nest, and the puffin chicks would run out, grab the fish, and then run back into the nest. Um, let's see, I think I have another. This is, this is where they like to nest normally, is in crevices and cracks and in rocks, or they'll even dig burrows in soil back into the ground. So they like it in these protected holes. And eventually, if the puffin chick gets bigger, this is what it will look like. And I had the great um, pleasure of when I was guiding trips out to uh, some of the islands where Steve Kress was doing that restoration work, one day he let me hold a puffin chick. And uh, they are just a great big ball of fuzz with a beak, right? They don't look anything like an adult puffin. Super, super cute. Millions of puffins to the north of us. This is the southern range. And uh, as Scudic, the Scudic ridges are an important you know, feeding area for them. Any questions about puffins? Okay. Here's another bird in the puffin family. This is the razor bill. And they're about a third the size bigger than a puffin. Uh, they are dressed in kind of a beautiful tuxedo, and they're very striking. They're kind of like a super puffin, right? And they too can dive deep 300 feet underwater in pursuit of fish, and they nest on a number of islands here off the coast of Maine, and at Petit Manan there's a handful of nests there each year. Uh, not a lot, just a couple. And in August, they too leave the islands with, with their young. Um, and historically, what scientists have known for, for, is that one of the adult birds will take that young chick and go out to sea with it. They'll, they'll stay at sea with it for a month or more and capture fish for it at sea. The young bird can't fly, the adult will stay with it and dive down and catch fish. And it was always thought that the, the adult bird was the female. And by capturing that adult 
bird at sea, they discover that it's actually the, the father. The father razorbill stays with the young razorbill and raises it up at sea. This is another bird in the puffin family, the common myrrh, and they uh, nest uh, especially up at Machaya Seal Island, and to the north of us, they're incredibly abundant, huge colonies of even hundreds of thousands, and uh, some of them uh, spend a lot of time at Petit Manan, and we see them uh, offshore, often in flight, um, flying from place to place, so they, they are here, they're not here in great abundance, but they are a beautiful bird to see, and one that you can see sometimes right off of Skudik Point here. Okay, this is a bird that's no longer here, but I, I, I thought it was important to mention because it is important as we think about the, the marine life that are here, that are part of the makeup of what we have um, off of Skudik and Skudik, the Skudik ridges, to think about the, the way things were years ago. Right, um, to reflect back because things have changed tremendously. And uh, this is one of the changes. You, at one time, there were millions of great auks. Their range extended from Iceland to North Carolina. Uh, this was a, f a flightless bird in the puffin family. And uh, there are 22 species in the puffin family um, today, and there are 17 species of penguin and all the birds in the puffin family are in the northern hemisphere and all 17 birds uh, that are in the penguin family are in the southern hemisphere. So this was a northern hemisphere penguin, right? It had evolved, to, it lost its flight and uh, unfortunately they were very easy prey for the early whalers and sealers and fishermen that came here a lot from Europe um, and they clubbed them and took their eggs and by 1886, the last great auk was killed. And so they're, they're no longer here. Um, the word penguin actually comes from the great auk. The first bird to be given the name penguin was a Welsh word, was a great auk. And so when, they, when whalers made their way to Antarctica and saw peng, pe, the flightless black and white birds there, they named them penguins. So penguins are actually named after the great auk. Okay, here's some, here's some uh, birds that uh, also nest on Petit Manan and um, are ones that we see offshore feeding at the Scudic ridges. And this is the common tern. And the common tern is a beautiful tern that's, that's quite abundant, as many as 1,500 pairs at Petit Manan. And uh, they go south during the winter. They spend a lot of their winter in South America. You, you may know with the terns, they're, they're challenging to tell apart. There's a number of species that look alike. The, uh, the main fishermen call these birds sea swallows, and they're very beautiful, very active, very vocal, and you often see them in flight. And uh, um, here are the common tern, the, uh, the, the marks that you use to, to, to recognize it, it has a orange bill with a black tip on the end, and it has a little bit of black in the outer edge of the wing, especially on the back panel. When it flaps its wing down, you can see that band of dark. And if you see that, that's very uh, diagnostic for that species. So uh, here is the Arctic tern. And here, uh, you may be familiar, this is the, with this bird, because it is the animal that probably has the longest migration of any on Earth. Uh, this is the bird that migrates uh, down to Antarctica, and then some of them, uh, recently they've discovered, will go on to, uh, to almost to Australia. They'll fly to Antarctica and then all the way around to Australia on the other side of the Earth, and then come all the way back. I have a, now here's some recent satellite tracking that have been done with the Arctic terns, and you can see that uh, some of them migrate down and then when they get down to Antarctica, they turn and go almost over to Australia. So this is, it was always known that they made it to Antarctica, but this part where they go to, Antar to Australia is new. Um, as many as 43,000 miles a year, and in their lifetime, 2.4 million miles. 
So that is a good uh, frequent flyer policy. <laughs> The Arctic Turn, you tell them apart from the common turn because they have a solid uh, bill, a solid um, orange bill. They also, do you notice the, uh, they're, they're lighter colored, to, uh, their wings, they don't have as, any dark along the trailing edge, not a lot, maybe just a fine little black line, but not a big smudge of, of darkness on that outer wing, and they have little short feet. The common terns stand up taller, and if you see one sitting and it has short feet, that's, a, that's an arctic tern. Here's the roseate tern, not a common species, becoming more and more endangered, and it's not clear really, to my understanding, they're still trying to determine why the numbers are dropping, but they are dropping significantly throughout the Gulf of Maine. Um, the roseate has a rosy breast, and uh, it's a very beautiful turn. They have long tail plumes, and they have a mostly solid dark bill, okay? They may have a little bit of orange in around the base, but mostly it's a very dark bill. If you see them fly over you with that rosy pink breast, then you could, that's an easy way to identify them. And overall, they're very white looking with a, with a solid dark head. So they stand out quite a bit from the other two species. Okay, here is um, Petit Manan again, and before we leave the island, I wanted uh, to mention that there's ter terrific research being done out there. Uh, they have a staff uh, from the Fish and Wildlife Service, and they also bring a lot of interns that are they're studying marine um, biology, marine wildlife out uh, to work on the island during the summer. One of the things they do is sit in these, these bird boxes, these bird blinds, and they observe what the, the birds are bringing back to, to feed their young. So they use a telescope, and they can, as when the terns land, they can identify the types of fish and food that the terns are bringing back to feed their young. And in this way, they can know what's going on uh, with the birds offshore. They're now starting to satellite or uh, radio track the terns to really identify how they're using the ocean. Uh, when they fly offshore, and same with the puffins, trying to really expand our sense of habitat beyond just the island, because what's important to them is also the areas where they're foraging out there. And um, I th think it would be interesting for the for folks here at Scudic that might be interested in this to, to maybe um, find out what's going on with that research as far as are those some of those terms coming over this way? Are they coming to Scudic? You know, do they, is this part of their their habitat is um, their range. If you're, if, if you're more interested in learning about the research at Petit Manan, you might consider going to this website. It's a blog and they post almost daily um, pictures and information about what's going on out there. Um, it's called Summer with the Seabirds and you can see pictures like this of baby guillemot chicks up close. <laughs> and puffin chicks and all, the, and all the research. It's really fun to follow what's going on out there because it's such a lively place. Lots of birds, lots of activity, lots of things happening. And uh, they also post from other islands where they're doing work too. Now the Fish and Wildlife Service have been a great partner for us. Um, we uh, were able to conduct um, from our whale watching boats four years of seabird research um, with the Fish and Wildlife Service, um, they put up the funding to have uh, students, uh, one from College of the Atlantic, one from the University of Maine, each spend two seasons on the top of our whale watch boat documenting all the seabirds, uh, identifying them, and actually um, using a, a very uh, high-tech computer system to, to record everything they saw and call into a headset that would re instantly record the location and the species. And uh, this is the kind of information that you can come up with. This is for shear waters uh, in uh, the summers of July 2009 and 10 out in the area. You can see our tra all those tracks are where the boat went. And then you can see the bigger circles or, or triangles highlight large concentrations of birds. 
So uh, this was a really exciting project and we, we try to use our boat to do as much research as we can. We're, we're always excited about having new, using it as a platform to, to, to do research. And so uh, this, this re research like this hadn't been done since the 1970s. So the fact that we've got four years worth of data like this is really exciting. Okay, well here is a bird that does, this bird does not nest here, uh, but is one that's very abundant offshore at the Scudic Ridge. It's a beautiful bird to see. How many people are familiar with the northern gannet? Okay, quite a few, not everyone. But if you're at Scudic in the summer, you'll often see them fly by at Scudic Point. And uh, I stuck in a picture down here. This is one I took in New Zealand this winter. That's the Australasian gannet. And uh, they're very similar. Um, I don't know, it's tough to think about how to tell them apart. They're so similar, but uh, they're a little bit of different color in their wings. But there's a pair on the nest, and they do nest to the north of us, the, the northern gannet nest up in Newfoundland. And uh, especially in the late summer, they show up here in great numbers uh, and in the fall. And they have a five to six foot wingspan. They're a seabird that feed on fish by diving from high in the air. They plunge, and sometimes we'll see hundreds of them plunging into the water. They often follow um, pods of porpoise or pods of dolphins. You see them associating with them. And uh, the, it takes a few years for them to gain their adult plumage, which is white with black wingtips and this golden yellow head. It's very striking. You can go also to the Gaspé Peninsula in the summer and see them nesting. Uh, here's another um, seabird that is from the north. Uh, and one of, the, one of the things that's special about the Scudic Ridges is that it's, it's such a great uh, mixing area for northern hemisphere birds, some like the northern fulmar that's here, that nest all the way up into the Arctic Circle, and southern hemisphere birds, some that nest in Antarctica. So you have a, you have a habitat where you have this mixing of birds from both these two um, extremes. So. Um, this, this bird, the northern fulmar, is a shearwater-like bird that has a tube on the top of its bill that's important that allows it to be able to uh, smell and track down food but through smell, and also part of a system that allows them to drink salt water. Birds like the, like the fulmar and a lot of the seabirds um, can have the the special ability of being able to drink salt water. This species comes in different color phases. They're called morphs. They're, they can be white. They can be kind of um, pinkish, well, soft, maybe like uh, gray. And they can also, down in the bottom corner here, be kind of chocolatey in color. And we see a lot of them in the fall. Um, they really show up. They nest in the north, and then they show up here. And it turns out a lot of them are here in the winter. Uh, this is another bird that we see at the Scudic Ridges, Manx Shearwater. They are a bird that are more abundant over in Europe and Scotland and England. Um, some of them are, do come here every year and some do nest here along the coast of New England and, and Maritime Canada. There was a pair in Gloucester Harbor in Massachusetts, a pair at Matinicus Rock. Um, a study was done with this bird where they took one off the nest in England and they banded the bird and they flew it to New York City and they wanted to see would this bird have the ability to find its way back and they released it and 11 days later it was back on its nest. This is a group of birds that we see a lot also in the fall because they are a bird that nests to the north of us, uh, the Jaegers. The Jaegers, they are an exciting bird to see. They are a aggressive hawk-like seabird that chase other birds down and steal fish from them on the wing. They're parasitic. And there's three species, the palmarine, the parasitic, and the long-tailed Jaeger. And uh, if you want to see them, a great opportunity would be to come on our main Audubon um, seabird trip that we do every year, and that is in September. 
um, in mid-September, and that's an eight-hour trip, and we go up into the Bay of Funday, and we often see dozens of Jaegers on that trip. Um, this is another bird from the north, the great skua. The great skua come down, especially in late summer and the fall. Uh, they have a, a very golden kind of color to them often. They have big white panels in the outer parts of their wings. They're big. They're as big as a greater blackback gull or bigger. Uh, skuas are very aggressive. You can see that bottom picture is one I took off the internet of a skua attacking a gannet trying to steal its fish. Uh, they, skuas will, in Antarctica, when I was down there, we would see them take penguin chicks, young penguins, and uh, here they will kill kittiwakes, birds of the size of a, a kittiwake is a small gull. They can take birds like puffins. Uh, so they're, they're, they are an active hunting bird. And uh, one that, uh, especially in the fall, we get a chance to see. Okay, here are, here's the, some of the southern hemisphere birds, and I, I'm going to run through a few more birds, then I wanted to uh, show off some of the other interesting kind of marine life that we can see, and then I'll get into the marine mammals and finish up with the marine mammals. So here's the south polar skua. This is a bird that you would see down in Antarctica, and they, they have the ability to migrate all the way up here to the Gulf of Maine to feed, and they come here uh, during the summer when it's the Antarctic winter, right? During our summer, it's winter there, so it's nice for some of them to make their way up here. That's why many of the southern hemisphere birds do come here, is to avoid the Antarctic winter. And here, there's tremendous food, so it makes sense for them to be here. Again, a big bird, darker, darker, grayer. Often, uh, they can have a light-colored head. Uh, the head is light, but the body is more dark, uh, usually, and not so orange and brown like the great skua. Um, the Wilson storm petrel, a little bird from the southern hemisphere. They nest in Antarctica, and then they come here, and they have the ability to walk on the water. They have webbed feet, and they walk across the surface, and they pick plankton off of the top of the water. Uh, they uh, are known to sailors um, as uh, St. Peter's bird, for that reason, because of St. Peter who could walk on water. Sometimes we'll see if the conditions are right, if it's calm and a lot of the plankton at the surface, there's certain times when I've seen 10, 15,000 of them or more on the surface of the water. Okay, sometimes we see rare species. This was only the fourth sighting for North America there was a white chin petrel, which is a bird which is normally found only down around Argentina and Antarctica and the southern hemisphere. And this is one that we spotted um, just offshore, not too far from the, the Scudic Ridges on August 24, 2010. Okay, great shearwater, another bird of the Scudic Ridges that's very abundant there during the summer. Just a summer bird, again, one that comes north uh, to feed in the summer and then migrates south to nest. And they nest down in the Falkland Islands and way down on islands down off of Africa. And uh, they have long tapered wings. And this is true, you'll see this with a lot of the oceanic seabirds. Their wings have evolved so they're long and tapered so they can catch the wind over the water, right? And like the albatross, they can just sail over the ocean for hours effortlessly. Um, it's, the, it's the wandering albatross that has the largest wingspan of any bird on Earth, up to 11 and a half feet, right, for that reason. Here's another that really shows off the ability. They'll, they'll, it's called dynamic soaring, where they use the wind over the water to, to fly up and down uh, for hours effortlessly. They don't even have to flap their wings. They just glide along. Uh, sooty shearwater. This is a dark, all dark shearwater, and they too have a tremendous migration. This is recent satellite tracking that's done over on the left side of this uh, slide, and you can see they nest in New Zealand, 
and they will leave and fly over, some of them to the coast of South America, up to uh, California, over to Japan, and then back down to New Zealand in one year, over 40,000 miles on migration. So uh, they are tremendously abundant bird, one of the most abundant seabirds. Mil you can see millions out in the Pacific, especially. In fact, there was uh, apparently uh, an enormous uh, flock of sooty shearwaters that arrived off of Monterey Bay uh, back in, I think, the 1930s or 40s. Monterey Bay, California, and there were so many there that it got a lot of press and news, and it was an odd, unusual thing to have these millions of birds show up. And Alfred Hitchcock um, was living there at the time, and he picked up on that, and he, that's where he, he got the idea to, to write that uh, movie, The Birds, this piece. Um, here is another long distance migrant that we see during the summer. We see them explode out of the ocean, the Atlantic bluefin tuna. And they can be up to 1,100 pounds. They can swim at over 40 miles an hour. We see a lot of fishermen trying to catch them. Um, here on the main coast, there was, there was uh, uh, a, a fishing boat that was following some bluefin tuna along the edge of an island. And uh, the, tuna, the tuna were in such a panic, chasing after the, the small fish. And one of the tuna leaped out of the water and leaped so high up out of the water, it landed on the beach and the rocks and seaweed and stranded itself. And the fishermen pulled their boat up on shore and took, a, took in a 400 pound tuna. And maybe the easiest catch ever. <laughs> Uh, this is the home range of the bluefin tuna, and it, they found, this is also something more recent that science has discovered with the help of satellite tracking. They always thought that there were two populations. There was a West Atlantic and the East Atlantic, and this is one of the reasons tuna have been mismanaged, is because um, they set quotas based on that idea. And it turns out that the home range of the bluefin tuna is the whole North Atlantic Ocean. The tuna that we see here in the Gulf of Maine during the summer could, in the same year, be seen up in Iceland, in the Mediterranean Sea, off of Morocco, and then back in the Gulf of Mexico, right, where they, where they breed. So they are highly migratory. They move thousands and thousands of miles across the ocean. And just a really, uh, really exciting, beautiful fish to see. It's another fish that we see uh, a lot of during the summer. Uh, they are not here in the winter, but they migrate into the Gulf of Maine, and this is the basking shark. The basking shark is the second largest fish in the world behind the whale shark. They can be up to 40 feet long. Uh, they can weigh upwards of 20,000 pounds. They are often found during the summer at the surface. You'll see their enormous fin, a dark fin cutting the water. And so that's where they get their name, basking, because they're often basking in the sun. However, recently, um, with, again, science and, the, and technology, it's one of the reasons I'm so excited about technology, because I think this is one of the things that could help us save a lot of wildlife. The things that we're learning, the things that are being applied to, to study wildlife is amazing. And here they were able to track some basking sharks during the winter, and they thought they, they just disappeared during the winter. No one knew where they went. Well, they found that they went to Brazil and they went down 5,000 feet into the ocean and they spent a, a, a half the year down deep in the water column and in, in the middle of the water column, out of sight. Um, just a fascinating study. So our sharks go to South America. Our basking sharks go to South America. They have a huge mouth and they feed on plankton. They eat, feed on those little tiny plankton, the copepods, and they just swim with their mouth open and strain them out of the water column. You can see there's a picture of a person near a basking shark. You can swim with basking sharks. They're not going to harm you. The worst they could do is gum you to death because um, they have no teeth. They, they just have gill rakers that are like whale baleen that filter the little plankton out of the water column. Um, this picture down on the bottom is one taken by a friend of mine who uh, flies a spotter plane for tuna out of Rhode Island and has for years. He has really remarkable pictures of lots of marine life. And, and he has observed um, uh, basking sharks many times in these huge vortices 
on the surface of the water. It's almost like a tornado of basking sharks going down into the water. And what is happening there? No one knows. Um, so they, they will come together in groups and they, they obviously have a very dynamic social uh, life. Um, right now there's a group in Canada that we're working with and then one in uh, Massachusetts that are both doing photo identification of basking sharks. When we see them beside the boat, we can get up close and they have unique fins and unique markings and if we get good enough photographs, um, that uh, they can identify them as individuals. So they now have a catalog of basking sharks as a way to try to learn more about them and their movements. Uh, ocean sunfish, they are tropical fish that show up here that, that uh, uh, are the largest bony fish in the world. Has anyone seen the ocean sunfish? Ah, just a couple of you, okay. <laughs> That's great. Well, uh, we sometimes uh, after uh, especially hurricanes, when, when a lot of um, uh, warm water comes north, will go back offshore and we, we've seen as many as 10 or 12 on a trip. And they can be enormous. You'll see their big fin. You might think it's a shark fin sticking out of the water, but it flops around their fin at the surface. They stay near the surface also for part of their life. They're not always near the surface, but in the summer they are. And so this is where they get their name, ocean sunfish. They're also known as the headfish because they look like a big head, or the moonfish because it kind of looks like a moon. And uh, they really don't have much of a tail. It's kind of a scalloped back edge, and they have a big fin on the top and one on the bottom. And they can weigh over 2,000 pounds. They can be uh, nine feet in length. They, uh, they're, they're really an amazing um, life form. They are kind of like a cross between a fish and a shark. They have a cartilaginous back, uh, partly uh, backbone, um, but, they're, but they also have a, um, uh, mostly a bony skeleton. Um, they produce more eggs than any other fish in the ocean. A female ocean sunfish, it's thought, can, can produce as many as 300 million eggs. Um, and they do jump out of the water like the basking shark. The basking shark and the sunfish will both breach sometimes. In fact, over in England, there was one that jumped out of the water and landed in a fishing boat with a father and son fishing and knocked the, the boy over, landed on him, you know, <laughs> giant sunfish. He was okay. <laughs> but That's what I, I think that's what you want, right? You want something good, like a story like that, or a lot better than a tattoo. You know, good animal scar. Okay, this is what they feed on. Lion's mane jellyfish, which we have here in great abundance. Um, this is the largest jellyfish in the world. It's found here in the Gulf of Maine and out at Skudik, off Skudik. They can be up to eight feet across and have tentacles 120 feet down into the ocean. And uh, they, when you look at them from above, they, they have, they're more light around the edge and dark red in the middle. So it kind of looks like a lion's with its mane. Um, so this is a type of plankton. Jellyfish are carried by the wind and sea, so they're a plankton. And this is another animal that feeds on jellyfish, the leatherback sea turtle. And uh, they are the largest of the sea turtles. They're found here in the summer. They can be up to nine feet across. They can dive to depths of over 4,000 feet. They can also weigh upwards of 2,000 pounds and uh, they come into the cold water. They have a lot of special adaptations as a sea turtle that allow them to be in cold water. Many of them go up to Newfoundland and even farther than the Gulf of Maine. We see lots of harbor seals offshore. They're not just found in harbors. They spend, they'll stay out at, at the, off 20 miles offshore and they'll sleep at the surface or sleep at the bottom and dive down and capture fish. We see lots of gray seals offshore. This is, 25 years ago, they were not very abundant. They were to the north of us in Canada. They're mostly a northern species of seal. They've expanded their range down into the Gulf of Maine, and uh, they are bigger than a harbor seal. They can, they, uh, a harbor seal might weigh 200 pounds. A big gray seal might weigh five, six, seven hundred pounds. 
the male has a larger nose and is very dark overall. The female, uh, her nose is a little softer, not as pronounced, and has a very light color to her neck with spotting. Um, they're, in Canada, they're called the horsehead seal because from side two, they kind of look like a horse's head. So they have really expanded their range down into the Gulf of Maine. They're now, they're now just two years ago, uh, College of the Atlantic discovered that during the winter, which is when they give birth, the females give birth in January, they are giving birth out at um, Mount Desert Rock and also down at Matinicus Rock. And at Matinicus Rock, the Puffin Project has a camera set up there and you can go on and watch the seals, um, hunt, you know, hundreds of the gray seals with their pups out there. Um, again, one of those wildlife cameras. Um, a really neat project uh, was done recently that uh, was done by some st a student at, at Duke University. This is a picture down at the bottom of the gray seals off of uh, Monomoy Island down off of Massachusetts. And it's one of the islands that they've really taken over. Um, what they found, what this student found was that at Google Earth, uh, they pick a day where they will, when it's clear and crisp to photograph the Earth in a location. And they chose a day to photograph Cape Cod. And he was, those, the resolution was so powerful with those pictures, he was able to go back and enlarge them and actually count all the seals on the beach from Google Earth from that day, right? Because they, what they do is they take a picture and that's the picture that's up for that period of time until they, they, they may change it out. And what, what the, as a way to try to figure out how many seals that, that are truly in Massachusetts, because there was a, there was, varying ideas about how many gray seals were there. Uh, they put satellite tags on uh, some of the gray seals and tracked them offshore. And they figured out what proportion of the seals were at sea at any time and ha versus on shore. And I think it was like 60 or 70 percent were normally at shore and 30 to 30 or 40 percent were at sea. And then they could actually do some modeling and really figure out truly how many seals. And the population they thought was around 10 or 12,000 is actually closer to 18,000 for Massachusetts now. So, and this is a, you can see a dive profile, both with the harbor and gray seal, they have the ability to dive to 1,500 feet up in the top there. You can see they'll dive in the, in the, in the pelagic zone to the, to the bottom. And uh, in shallow water, they go everywhere for food. But with this great increase in both harbor seals and gray seals in the Gulf of Maine, this has led to an increase in great white shark sighting, and especially down off of Massachusetts, but also uh, to the north. And uh, uh, let's see, there's a, there's, a, there's a really exciting video. You can go on uh, the internet and look up on YouTube, uh, Booth Bay Harbor Great White, and a lobster fisherman last summer was able to capture uh, video of a great white shark uh, feeding on a dead whale at the surface. It's an, enor an enormous great white shark. Uh, a lot more seals are being seen now offshore with bites from, from there's got to be great white shark bites. Um, and some recent, again, science, excuse me, um, they are, they're satellite tracking and even radio tracking great white sharks now. You can go on and watch these tracks. They're, they're, some of them are live. This is a, one of this shark named Lydia, and you can see her track from Florida all the way up to, to uh, Newfoundland. Um, some radio tracking recently, they, at one time they had six great whites off of Halifax. And so we know that they're moving north, you know, north and coming up into the cold water. More and more, it seems, the sightings with the warming water, with the water warming. Um, in fact, uh, friends of ours that run the whale watch up in St. Andrews, two years ago, they saw a great white shark attack and kill a porpoise right at the surface, right next to the boat. Yeah. Here is a picture of harbor porpoises. This is a really exciting species for Scudic and the Scudic ridges. They're very abundant. Um, 
especially in the area between Skudik and Mount Desert Island. When we're going out of the bay last summer on our way in and out, hundreds and hundreds of porpoise. You can stand right on Skudik Point and see them. And we know very little about what they're doing and why they're there. Really understudy and uh, one that um, is different from a dolphin in that it's smaller and has a rounded head while the dolphin has, is bigger and has a beak and different shaped teeth. The dolphin have pointed teeth. The, this is the Atlantic white-sided dolphin. This is the species that we see offshore on our whale watching trips and they can be super fun. They will come up and ride the bow. The porpoise aren't interested in the boat, but the dolphins are. They will leap up in our wake. They'll jump 10 or 15 feet in the air. And uh, well, one of the most exciting things that's ever happened to me when I was doing research at Mount Desert Rock um, with Allied Whale, we were out one day in August and it was very warm. The water was warm. It was around, it was in the 60s, which is warm for here. And we, there were no large whales around to study, so we were, we were in the water swimming and a, a big group of dolphins came by, about 200 white-sided dolphins. And I got to see them underwater like you're seeing in that picture there to the left, um, in groups swimming past me. And you can hear all the sound of the dolphins in the water. You could, they would swim at you, you could feel the echolocation, you could feel, the, feel them, the, the vibration of the sound hitting you as they scanned your body. And to see them that way is just, it's such a profound, um, impactful thing to, to have that uh, kind of uh, experience, to realize what they're, what they're capable of, you know, in that environment. So they're big, 10 feet, 500 pounds. And again, another species that we really don't know a lot about in the Gulf of Maine. We see them, we sometimes see hundreds. One day, I was not on the boat, but th this was two, two years ago, Everyone on board, our crew uh, and guides, said they saw, they thought probably between one and two thousand. That's the most I've heard of. And, uh, you know, a great, a great, interesting species that there's still a lot to learn about them. Um, minke whale. This is a whale that we see a lot around Scudic Point and also at the Scudic Ridges. You can see them from shore. They'll come into Frenchman Bay. Um, they are the smaller of the larger baleen whales. At a bigger size, around 33 feet is one of the record lengths. Normally they're more like 20 feet. And uh, they don't fluke, they don't lift their tail out of the water, they don't really have much of a spout. But they do jump. This is one picture taken up in uh, Passamaquoddy Bay of one jumping out of the water. They do breach. And when they, when they do, or if they swim up to the boat, because they can be very friendly and curious, you'll see they have a little white patch of white on their flipper, on the little window of white there. And uh, this is the one that the whaling controversy has been centered on in recent years, the one that Japan and Norway hunt, right? Or uh, now Japan may not be hunting because they've been denied. But. Okay, here is another and by the way, we almost always see them by themselves. Occasionally we've seen two together. Once in a long while we've seen a mother with a calf. But this doesn't seem to be a place where we see so many mothers and calves. So what is happening with that? I'm not sure. Um, and they will sometimes swim with other species of whale. We've seen them with finbacks or with humpbacks. The humpback is really the whale that we see the most of, probably, during the summer. In the winter, they are in the Caribbean, mating and breeding and singing. They have that beautiful song. They found some can sit underwater and sing for half an hour without coming back up to breathe. And uh, they migrate across oceans, thousands of miles. Uh, they can be about 40 feet and 60,000 pounds. A record size is 63 feet, and when when uh, the sailors years ago with their wooden sailing ships um, sailing through the Caribbean or at night, they would hear through the, the hull of the ship uh, the sa the song of the humpback whale, and they would think it was mermaids. They did not know what it was, right? That beautiful song, but now we've discovered what it is, 
and it is exciting to see that the humpback population is increasing uh, around the world. Their numbers are coming back, so that's very exciting. This is uh, what we see a lot if there's fish. We see a lot of humpback whales feeding at the surface, lunging in big groups together, uh, lunging, open mouth feeding, and uh, a scientist up in Alaska who I got to meet, a man named Fred Sharp, did some really exciting research where he put um, uh, tags on the individual whales while they were doing this and a lot of acoustic equipment in the water and was able to determine that when they're in these feeding groups, uh, there's one whale that is the lead whale that does the talking and guides the others. The others are silent. And that one whale dives first, the other fall in behind. It's very ordered. Um, they will go under a school of fish and drive them up from below, and that one lead whale will make a piercing, <coughs> piercing cry that's a whining cry that drives the fish, scares them to the surface, and they will come racing up, and then they throw their flippers up to, hold, to make sure the fish can't escape, and they lunge up with their mouth open together. And so it's a very coordinated attack. And uh, um, we have had times uh, where we've seen as many as eight or 10 or I think 11 on one trip feeding like this at the Scudic Ridges. We know most of them by name. This is one of my favorite whales, a whale named Gemini that has killer whale teeth marks on the tail over on that corner there, you can see those rake-like marks where he, where he was attacked when he was younger. Uh, about five to seven percent of the humpbacks have teeth marks from killer whale attacks. Uh, Gemini has been known by uh, Allied Whale, the group that we work with, that we have their researchers on every one of our whale watch trips. Um, this whale they've been tracking since 1976, right? So uh, humpback whales can live 40 or 50 years. They're not the longest lived of the whales. We now know the bowhead can live up to over 200. But um, this whale is very special, one that we see a lot of, and we know them by the pattern on the underside of the tail. Each tail is unique like a fingerprint. Some are black, some are white, all different shades of color. And uh, I was just at a workshop the other day. We were doing a whole bunch of matching of the tails and trying to figure out which whales that we know regularly um, we could help in matching um, with over at Allied Whale. They now have over 7,000 matched, getting closer to 8,000 for the North Atlantic for nearly 40 years. Okay, so here is another species of whale that's abundant off of Scudic and Scudic Ridges, and that is the finback. The finback is the second largest whale on Earth. Uh, the only whale bigger is the blue whale. Uh, an average size finback is probably around 50 to 60 feet, although the record length is 89 feet. Uh, this is a boat that was used when I first started whale watching that we used to study finbacks and take pictures of them uh, for, co for College of Atlantic, a boat called Island Queen. Maybe some of you remember that boat. And with the finback, they don't often lift their tail out of the water like the humpback. They don't have the unique pigmentation on the underside of the tail. So allied whales discovered that you can tell them apart by the color on the, the right side of the head. There's a beautiful pattern there. Uh, and then um, the shape of the dorsal fin and marks and scars on the body. Some of them are without fins. Um, the one in the middle there is a female named Lunch. She lost her fin to probably a boat propeller. And you can see some rope scars on this whale to the right. And so it's any, any mark like that you could use to, to know that whale, track it, and follow it over its lifetime. And many of the finback whales are named and tracked and uh, uh, are also up for adoption. You can adopt a whale from Allied Whale and uh, followed this way. <coughs> They, a big finback whale might be able to eat as much as four to 5,000 pounds of food in a day, and they'll take fish and plankton. Like the humpback, they, they don't just take plankton. They, will, they have a variety, variety of prey that they will feed on. So there is a catalog that for, the, for the finbacks as well in the North Atlantic. I think that's nearly 
between two and 3,000 individual whales that are known. But still, a lot of things we don't know about them. We don't know where they go in the winter. The, right, the finback whales that are here in the summer, we're not sure where most of them are in the winter. Uh, we're not sure very much about their mating, when it takes place, how it takes place. We're not sure where they go to give birth. It's speculated that it's an area about 600 miles off Bermuda because a lot of sounds of finback whales are heard there in the winter, but it's not clear. Um, a lot of things that are still unknown. Okay, well, there's been a lot, as somebody who's observed this, uh, this environment for 25 years, in the last couple of years, there's some really um, strange things happening. And one was in 2012, was this uh, fact that the water temperature was so warm, right? And we had uh, lobsters shedding their shell in March and in the winter here off the coast of Maine. And fishermen that have been fishing their entire life, 60, 70 years, had never seen that. The water temperature was warm enough that it stayed warm throughout the winter, stayed up that they started, the, the water temperature triggers them to shed their shell. They started shedding early and it threw the market into a uh, downward spiral, right? Because all those lobsters that would normally be hard shell for the fishermen in the early part of the summer that they make really good money with and then and later in the summer they sell a lot of the soft shell lobster to Canada, they, they didn't have that good market for the hard shells. They were all soft shells. So, uh, so the price bottomed out. A lot of the fishermen just tied their boats up and stopped fishing. It really it was a huge impact on the, on the lobster fishermen. Water temperature is a big thing. And for over 100 years, they've been measuring water temperature in the Gulf of Maine at a station down um, at the Bigelow Lab in southern Maine. And the water temperature in the last 10 years, especially late in the fall, has been higher than it's ever been recorded. Um, we're now seeing tropical fish show up from, you know, mid-Atlantic fish. Uh, scup are being uh, sh fished here, which we're never here. Um, butterfish, um, they're a small fish, but they're very round. They're not thin like the herring, and they're tiny. They're showing up here from the mid-Atlantic. A lot of the seabirds are catching them, terns and puffins, and trying to feed them to their young, but they're too big, they're too round and the, bird, the, the, their, the, the chicks are dying because they can't ingest them. So water temperature is certainly a thing of concern for our environment. Oh, oh here it is. Fancy, one fancy graphic. Okay. Uh, Gulf Stream. <laughs> the Gulf Stream a few years ago moved north about 200 miles. The Gulf Stream is, is starting to encroach more and more on the Gulf of Maine and bring more warm water in here. What is that going to mean for Skudik and the ridges? Uh, sea turtles. In the last couple of years, really tremendous amounts of sea turtles, more than ever. A lot of leatherback turtles, a lot of them being caught up in fishing line, fishermen releasing them. Um, even more of the warm water tropical sea turtles showing up here, uh, more than I had ever seen. And uh, so I think that sh points again to the warm water, the idea that the, water's, the water is having an impact on, the, on them being here. Um, two years ago, there was a, well, the scientist, I've had the, the chance to meet him, Jeffrey Runge, who works out of uh, the Gulf of Maine Research Institute in Portland. And he's been studying plankton out at P uh, Platts Bank and found that the plankton all of a sudden dropped in abundance down to 20% of what they had been. And there was this huge dip. And he really thought it was a result of a lot of rainfall in the spring, a lot of runoff, and also warming water together that resulted in that. Um, so a great dip in the amount of plankton at the same time. Um, also, uh, I guess I'll go to this slide. Different, different large species of animal, uh, animals uh, being impacted. Um, 
new, new tropical marine mammals showing up here, sperm whales in the Gulf of Maine, other more warm water species of dolphin pushing into the Gulf of Maine more. Um, the northern Gannet colony uh, two years ago collapsed up in Newfoundland and the Gannets left. And so there was something happened in the ecosystem that year. Uh, finback whales, last year was the least amount of finback whales I've ever seen. I mean, I just can't, I mean, normally they're, they're here in great abundance. It was an odd year not to see a lot of them. Right whales that gather in the Bay of Funday, you may know the right whale is a whale that, that summers here and, uh, well, they're here year round, but especially up in the Bay of Funday off of Graham and Ann, uh, they gather there in the late summer and fall to feed on plankton. And sometimes there's only about 500 right whales, as many as two or 300 will be there. Well, the last three years, there have been very few very few. The research team there is looking at moving their research to the north. They think the right whales have pushed north to Nova Scotia or Newfoundland, and they're starting to try to think, you know, what, where are the whales? We don't know where they are. Um, so big things happening, all these things together, and a lot of us in this circle really talking a lot about it, like what's going on? So what is this? What what does this mean? And what and how? Maybe, um, you know, how can we keep track of what's really happening out there? Are we doing a good enough job? You know, do we really know what's happening? I don't know. I think we get pieces. We get, we get little snapshots, but is, it, is this just a, a cyclical thing, or is this something that's more systemic? I'd like to finish, um, well, almost finished with this, uh, um, the right whale. This was, um, I know Seth talks about your spark species. This was mine, uh, you know, a species of wildlife that really sparks you to become fascinated with nature. And uh, this was mine for, for, for the ocean, was the right whale. My first encounters with right whales up in the Bay of Funday. They um, are a huge animal that have an enormous tail and we see them, some, in some summers we might see them 20 or 30 times, in other years we might just see them a couple of times on our trips. But they, they, they um, are an animal that can be upwards of 50 or 60 feet and weigh over 100,000 pounds. Uh, they are here in the summer and then they move down to Florida and Georgia in the winter. And they have no dorsal fin. And they're really an interesting species. I, I had the chance to just participate in an international workshop on right whales when I was in New Zealand at that conference. And uh, so the right whale, one of the things that hasn't been known about them uh, for a long time is where a lot of them are in the winter. It's been known that about a third of them go down to Florida and Georgia for the winter to, to, to give birth to their young. Um, but during that same time, uh, a lot of them disappear, and they don't know where they go, or they, or they haven't known where they are. Um, a few years ago, a Navy ship was traveling through the Gulf of Maine, had left Portland and was traveling offshore, and they came into an area where there was a whole bunch of whales in the middle of January, and they reported to the Coast Guard, who reported it to the Fisheries Service, who sent a plane up, and they found dozens of right whales right off, right off the coast of Maine in the middle of winter. And so this really triggered scientists to start, they put more, more planes up in the air and really realized that this area that's about 70 miles from here uh, to the west, to the southwest, it's called Jordan Basin and it's over towards kind of south of Isle of Ho, a place called Newfound Ground that's offshore is a important wintering area for right whales where they are giving birth, uh, excuse me, where they are mating where they think the mating is happening, right? So they, all this time they've searched over in Iceland, they've searched in the Azores, they've gone all over the world looking in the winter, and it turns out they're right here in our backyard, and no one knew. And so we were able to uh, reach out to one of the top right whale scientists in the world. Her name is Mo Brown, she's up there with the right whale on her hat, and she's a Canadian scientist who works out of the New England Aquarium in Boston. And 
we having the boat that we do, which is such a uh, great platform, a big, fast boat that can get offshore when the weather breaks in the winter, we offered it to them at a very reduced price, and they were able to put the money together to do some research expeditions. And so we used our boat to go out on four trips to Jordan Basin and spend the day out there and uh, do right whale counts. And uh, one day we had 35 right whales and uh, this is pictures that were taken of one that breached near the boat. And so uh, a tremendous success. Um, what we've realized in doing that and with this aerial research, it actually turns out that that area that we were in isn't always the area where they are during the winter when they're here. Sometimes they'll move out to Cassius Ledge. Sometimes they'll move down the coast a little bit more toward Portland. Um, I, I'm wondering, do they come? Do they move up this way? Why not? Why, well, I mean, it's very possible that they could be maybe sometimes dozens of right whales here in the winter right off Skudik. We don't know. You know, I'm not saying that's true. I just, we just don't know because we lose track of them. Um, and the plane, you know, is limited. They can, the planes can only do so much and be some, so many places at one time. So this is, uh, this is an exciting development that we have this population of uh, one of the most endangered whales in the world right here off the coast of Maine, very close to Skudik, that is uh, breeding, breeding during the winter. It's a really an amazing story. And uh, I just wanted to finish by maybe throwing out a few potential ideas that I had. I didn't, uh, as far as maybe some kind, of, some of the kind of research that that could be considered for organizations like Scudic Institute and College of the Atlantic and the University of Maine collaborating, Acadia National Park. Maybe there is. Uh, some exciting things that we could do off of Skudik and the Skudik ridges, right? One, I think, would be doing winter marine mammal and seabird surveys. When we were out there in the winter, you, it looked like a different world. There were right whales everywhere. There were northern fulmars, kittiwakes, dove keys. Uh, all, all the bird seabirds were different for the most part. Um, there were there were murs, there were th there were uh, uh, puffins, but it was a very different ecosystem out there. We know very little about it. What's going on out there in the winter? Very little, you know. And and and, and I don't know of anyone that's done surveys off the Scudic ridges in the winter. I mean, fishermen are out there. They tell us some, but they may not tell us everything. Um, deep sea work that could be done here off of Scudic. Uh, I think that, you know, I have a friend that is involved in this. He discovered 300 species, part of an effort out for California. They discovered 300 new species when he was working there on running these ROVs. I mean, we could, ha we could have equally as many new species right here. He, t he totally believes that. He runs a project called Oceans Wide. His name is Buzz Scott, and he is a Mainer. He's from Matinicus, and he's back here trying to establish this kind of research. I think that could be a really exciting thing for the park, for the for Skudik, to really, you know, maybe again, this is all of all of this, you know, has to do with funding and, and money. Um, harbor porpoise. I mean, they are they are incredibly abundant in the summer. Uh, it would be really exciting to be able to conduct some surveys, to spend some time with them out there, really try to gauge what's going on, how many porpoise there really are. Um, I mean, these, the, 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 es the way that they come up with estimates and things are, are highly, uh, are, are difficult, I think. I think, I think, uh, I think that this could be a really exciting thing that's right here, that's right here. Um, white-sided dolphins. I, this is something that I think we're really lacking in, knowing, uh, a lot about their ecology. Could we... Could we use the College of the Atlantic's boat, the Osprey, and, f and stay with a group of white-sided dolphins for, for a number of days? You know, stay with them night and day, shadow them, follow them, see what, you know, use our depth sounder to see if there's fish below, follow them, try to really, if there's a window of weather there, 
really try to gain more than just a snapshot of seeing them for, for 15 minutes. You know, really try to sense how, what, what's going on. How are they using this habitat out there? Um, we have, there's, there's no good map of this area between Scudic and Scudic ridges. There's no good 3D map. I tried at the University of Maine. I tried at the College of the Atlantic to get one for this presentation. Um, they, they all, you know, they said, yeah, no, we really, you know, that would be neat to have. <laughs> it's a very exciting topography. It's very mountainous. It's like, it's like um, uh, at one point we had a 3D depth sounder on the boat that we used for a few weeks, and it looked like mountain ranges. It was incredible. Ledges, huge cliffs, all sorts of exciting topography out there. One of the best fishing places in, in the Gulf of Maine was the Scooter Bridges. Enormous amounts of haddock, hake, cod, pollock, flou uh, halibut during the summer. We, we don't have a really good map of, that, of this ocean bottom. And I think fish surveys were really lacking. I mean, there is, there is some stuff that's done by the Department of Marine Resources where they come up the coast and they, they sample fish as they go and drag. But to really understand fish like the Atlantic herring and how they're using that environment out there, we're, we're really, we don't, we don't know. And it's so important to maintaining this great abundance of life. So those are just a couple of thoughts I had about that. Um, it's a really exciting environment. We're right on the door of this here at Skudik. It's a, I mean, if you're standing at Skudik Point, you can see out 11 miles if you're at the water line. If you're up 50 feet, you can easily see out 15. You can look right out. If you're looking at Scudic Point, you look to the left and look out there on the horizon, you're looking at the Scudic Bridges. So next time you're out there, think about that. That is a really exciting environment. I've seen at times 70 or 80 whales out there on one trip. Um, it can be, it's not always like that. <laughs> And we don't, we don't try to market it that way, but it can be like the African Serengeti. You know, it can be, there can be days where there's hundreds of dolphins, th tens of thousands of birds, and life everywhere, and I hope that you find yourself out there on one of those days. Thank you. I'm happy to take any questions if you want. I know I've been talking a long time, so f feel free if you want. If, you, if some of you want to leave, that's fine, but I'm happy to stay and take any questions here. Yeah? When you showed the uh, original uh, that map that you had, the hippo mm -hmm. section, can you tell us, I mean, I know the, the box, but I wasn't able to look at it uh, long enough to, to get a sense of how many, were we talking square miles or? Yeah. How big is that um, area? Let's see, we'll go back. The question was, how big actually is the area on the map that I showed at the beginning uh, that marks off the Scudic Ridges and this area called the ballpark? How, how big is that in terms of miles? Okay, let's see here. Here's the picture. It's back up on the screen. And that area um, from one end to the other is about three to four miles long and maybe as much as five miles um, north and south. So it's a pretty big area. Um, there's an inner Scudic Ridge, and that's the one I was focusing on, but there's also an outer Scudic Ridge, which is another seven miles beyond, and you can see that in dark print there. And so that's another, we do venture out there if the whales aren't inshore. At that spot, it's not uncommon for us to push out there. We do find them out there at times. So there's, there's a, there's a very mount. It's very shallow, then mountainous, then the depth drops off to five or six hundred feet, and seven hundred feet. There's about six, seven miles of that, and then it comes back up. There's another ridge out there. Any other questions? Yes. Yes, a 
Yeah, the question was how deep, um, I was talking about how deep birds, some of the seabirds could dive. How deep can the leatherback sea turtle dive? And, and, and seabirds or just the leatherback? Yes, please. Okay, so the leatherback can go down over 4,000 feet. They are one of the deepest diving animals. You know, they've been on Earth going back to the time of dinosaurs. A great book to read if you're more interested in them is the one by Carl Safina, who's my favorite um, marine conservation writer. He, um, he wrote the book um, Eye of the Albatross as well, all about albatross, which is my favorite book I've ever read. Um, but Carl Safina's book on sea turtles is brilliant. And uh, uh, he goes into all the natural history. He starts at a beach down in Trinidad where they're nesting, you know, witnessing this, where they're actually digging the hole right on the beach. But they are an amazing um, form of life. Yeah. And a lot of the seabirds, the alcids, are diving down hundreds of feet. Uh, birds like shearwater normally stay at the surface, but I've been told by a friend of mine who uh, fishes up in Alaska that they have caught them on long lines down a couple hundred feet. So things like sooty shearwater. So uh, the myrrh can probably go down 500 feet, I think, is five, you know, at least 500. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah, yeah. The puffins uh, were down to maybe nesting on one island. They had been. The thought is that they were hunted out. Um, probably they were never really in huge abundance. This has always maybe been the southern, or or re at least recently the southern range of their limit, but. Uh, there's, there seems to be a lot of evidence. I know Steve Kress really believes that uh, they were taken by the early settlers. They would, they would throw nets down over the burrows and take them for food. Uh, they would take their eggs. They were easy prey for, the, for them. They didn't want to eat fish all the time. And so uh, they, uh, and, and interestingly, there's also quite a few records of Native Americans that lived here for thousands of years managing the seabird islands so they didn't over, over hunt them. They would actually meet in the springtime and discuss who was going to take what from what islands. But with, uh, with the Europeans, that, that, that sense of management it really didn't hold and uh, so their numbers were really hunted down um, like the Great Auk. You know where it was completely hunted out, hunted out. So it was really that effort to release them, and it took it took seven years before the first puffin came back to that island. So you know, Steve Kress is a I know Seth knows him well and has worked with that project a bunch. is is a uh, a tough customer. You know, to stick with that for that long to see it through, and they used bird calls and decoys to lure them back to the island to bring them back, and it worked. And now. Those techniques that were developed right here off the coast of Maine, well, he and his staff have gone all around the world where there's problems with seabirds, and they uh, have provided huge um, uh, information and, and exchange in trying to bring back other seabird populations. So it's much, there's much more of an impact. I think even probably, you know, not not to belittle puffins here. But you're talking with some seabird species where you're down to just a few hundred, not not like the puffins where there's millions, and and to use what we what we've learned here to save a species from extinction, I mean that that is amazing, and that's all that's all work that's been done here. Wouldn't you wouldn't you agree, Seth? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, the question was, uh, with all the, the information I was discussing about impacts of warming water and bigger changes that might be impacting the Gulf of Maine, uh, what about ocean acidification? And that is that a concern and an issue? That is a huge issue. In my mind, it's the number one thing. I mean, I think everything, almost everything else, we we can we can probably you know. Uh, have some 
ability to affect a, a positive change with. Potentially ocean acidification is the thing that may, keeps me up at night because you're talking about a total disruption of the, eco, of the environment. Basically with ocean acidification, with all the car, man-made carbon that's being put, produced and pumped into the atmosphere through fossil fuels, the oceans are a sink tank for that. They're absorbing that carbon. The, it's, this isn't, this isn't uh, what might be theory, you know, what you could, even some people would say is theory, like with warming temperatures. This is absolute fact that the oceans are getting more and more acidic, right? And with that uh, acidic um, water, it's affected a lot of species. It's now, it's had uh, huge die-offs of shellfish in Washington and Oregon, the Chesapeake Bay of oysters, and more recently, clams here in the Gulf of Maine. Uh, also at some of the farms where they farm mussels. Uh, Bill Mook, who runs uh, Mook Sea Farms, they produce a tremendous amount of mussels here, has had a lot of, uh, uh, of his mussels die off and thinks it's a result of this ocean acidification. Um, they're not able to produce their shells and they're not able to survive. There's been die-offs of larval plankton, sea urchins, sea cucumbers, some of the very foundational species in the ocean are not, are, are not surviving. So if that trend continues, uh, oh, coral reefs, another one, where it's had a huge impact. So if that trend continues, that could, if it could disrupt the very foundation of the ocean, you know, what does that mean? You know, if it starts to do that, I think it's it's huge. So fortunately, um, I've, I've had a chance to go to a couple of meetings recently. Uh, the there there's a uh, a man named Brad Warren from Washington State who has been coming here because over in Washington they've been very progressive when they when this when they realized this was happening, uh, the governor put together a task force of fishermen and marine resource users and scientists to address this issue. It was a state task force and he has been working with the state of Maine to do that. And it's taken a couple of years, but the Island Institute got behind this and really have pushed it through. And we just passed a law in Maine that is gonna set up a task force that's similar with funding to look, start looking at this issue. We, we have a national uh, organization which only has, I think, six people working at it. Only six, you know, scientists and staff at the federal level in Washington D.C. on this issue. So, um, so it's it's uh, it re we really need to get more funding, to more more research, and more done because I think that could be the biggest thing affecting all this life. I mean, imagine if the food chain were to start collapsing in places. What that would mean for marine life, for seafood, and everything. It would be it would be huge. Thank you. Okay, well, I'll stay after and ask, answer any questions you have if you want to meet with me. And uh, thank you very much. Happy International Bird Migration Day. <laughs> right, thank you. Thank you. So the Scudic Institute is a place that brings together passion and knowledge. And um, it's hard to find folks uh, um, that are more pat that are uh, as passionate. It's, it's not, it's hard to find folks. Anyway, I'm trying to say that this guy is as passionate as he is knowledgeable, and that's what's special about the Scudic scholars and bringing them here. So thank you very much, Zach. And one thing I can report to you with respect to ocean acidification is that the, the Institute um, has recently entered into an agreement with Earthwatch so we, in fact, are this summer um, piloting a couple of Earthwatch programs, bringing high school students from California, um, sponsored by a foundation whose name I don't know. Um, but they will be studying ocean acidification with a um, Dr. John Sigliano, a researcher. So Earthwatch uh, brings um, world-class researchers on special topics um, together and, and invites the public and or uh, school groups to help the researcher conduct the experiment. It's a grand way of doing citizen science. 
And so um, we are really proud to have that as one of our pilot programs this coming summer. So I, uh, finally, thank you so much for coming out today. Um, as Zach said, he'll hang around if you want to ask some questions to him privately. Um, other than that, have a um, safe drive home. Um, enjoy the display on the passenger pigeon that's out in the, in the foyer. Um, it is the 100th anniversary of the extinction of that particular species, and our little ode to the passenger pigeon is out there, and you can take advantage of that. Thanks to those of you, such as Ed uh, Hawks and Deb Hawks, who came over from MDI and, and had the uh, wood carving display in the, um, this morning during the Junior Ranger and IMBD celebration. And special thanks to Kate Petrie, um, and in, in one of the educators and interpreters from the National Park who put together um, today's uh, events and to the volunteers that she assembled to, to pull that off today. So thank you all for your participation. And we'll see you again. Bye-bye. <laughs>